Hi, I'm Randy Robinson. This is Life Today TV. I have a special guest today. I have the author of the book, The Shack. Paul Young is with me. Paul, thanks for coming. Great to be with you. Got a great history with you and Betty and your your father. Mm -hmm. He's been mm -hmm. such a such a great comfort and encouragement to me. He, you know, he calls me up every once in a while. He says, so, Paul, has this gone to your head yet? <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> you know, and, you know, that's a fair question. It's I mean, a totally fair 18 question. 18 million copies of your book. I know. Weird. Right? I mean, that's, that's every author's dream, right? Yeah. But it can also be somebody's nightmare. I mean, because yeah. uh, let's, I know you're making more than a dime a book, but even in a dime a book, that makes you a millionaire. Yeah. Right? Yep. How is all that, uh, the, the notoriety, uh, the, the money, how has that affected you? Well, one of the things that I think is really significant is that the first 15 copies that I made at Office Depot, right? Because I'm not like a for real author. I didn't do this on purpose. Um, those first 15 copies did everything that I ever wanted this book to do. So all of the rest of this is a God thing. And, and I know it is. If it went away tomorrow, I'd be fine because the things that matter to me were all in place before I wrote the book. And I'm surrounded by... You know, you don't know who I'm married to, but she's in North Dakota, Minnesota, and her and her five sisters are called the Force. They're not going to take any, you know, guff from anybody. They're and not going to let it go. No, no, no. And my, my girls have said, Dad, you have so ruined the idea of celebrity for us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so there is that whole part of it that I'm surrounded by layers of relationships and friendships, people who, you know, they'll continually tell me the truth and laugh along with me about this crazy wave of grace that I got to participate in. Other than the obvious uh, thing of not having to worry about next month's electric bill, yeah. what's been the good part of, of having oh, a lot Easy. Of money? That's easy. Um, you know, I was working three jobs when I wrote The Shack, and, uh, and I, my main job was working for a little manufacturer's rep office. I was shipping out soldering tips and cleaning toilets. They did, they did circuit board manufacturing distribution and rep. And, um, and so people ask me, what do I do now that I don't, you know, ship out soldering tips? And I tell them, I get to hang around burning bushes all day. What does that mean? That means every human being is a story. And the shack has given people permission to talk about their great sadness, their stories. And they send them to me. And I meet them in the signing lines. And, and you know, you get to see kind of how grace has been woven through the tapestry of people's lives. There, there is no greater honor than to be allowed into that space in somebody else's life. I mean, they're saying, I trust you enough to be here. I'm going to tell you what matters to me. And I, but how cool is that? That's the single best thing that's ever happened as a result of this. And, and the thing that you won't want to bring up because you won't want to talk about yourself is the generosity. But I know you've been generous. We've always been generous, you know? So when we had like two nickels to rub together, we would give one nickel away, you know? And so we've been able to do some amazing things. And yeah, you know, it's just, again, you still live inside the grace of one day. So you still got to hear what the Spirit is saying to you with regard to what you have. You know, if that stuff starts to become important, and Kim and I are both at that place, people don't know we lost everything the year before I wrote The Shack. I mean, lost everything. And it was part of the healing process, dealing with issues of the fear of financial insecurity, right? Nothing like losing everything to help heal you of the fear of financial It's kind of like... The world doesn't end, you find out. Well, exactly. It's like, and one of the things we learned was the imagination of the things we are afraid of are far larger and bigger than the realities of them. And it's what sustains you through those things is relationship. Yeah. And everything that matters stayed in place. In fact, it got deeper. So when this side of things happened unexpectedly, it's with open hands and, and we, get to, we get to participate, you know? So we've done a lot of really cool things, especially in the Portland area, so. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. nice. Now I wanna talk about Crossroads, your new book. Thank you. But I, I want to touch first on some of the criticism that came out of the shack because, yeah. wow, I mean, we took heat for having you on I know you today. Did. And I so appreciate and, that yeah. you take yeah. that kind of risk. But you but, did. And, and the criticism, yeah, here's how I look at it. An angry person is at least involved in the conversation, <laughs> right? Because yeah. yeah. if they're ambivalent, they just don't care. Right. And, and when a person comes to me and they're upset or they're, and frankly, a lot of them never read the book. They right? just read the criticism about the book. Well, yes, and they picked it up and so they're upset. And, 
But when they're coming to you, they're not telling me about me. I already know about me. I've lived with me for a long time. And, uh, and so I know about me. So they're, they're unless I let them, they're actually telling me about them. They're telling me what makes them angry, what they're afraid of. Usually anger is connected to something you're afraid of. And if I can listen, I can hear what they're saying. And also, these are my people, right? I'm missionary kid, preacher's mm, yeah. kid, raised in evangelical, fundamental kinds of Pentecostal, uh, not Pentecostal, but Protestantism. Pharisees are my people, you know? I were one of them. And so I, I identify here. And so when the, when the conversation is happening, I'm thinking, look how this is expanding. You know, the only time it gets difficult is when people realize, and only some and only a few, but they realize they can't go after you, so they go after your kids. Yeah. That's when you have to deal with real issues of forgiveness and things like that. Uh, in Texas, we use guns. I, mean, I know, and ask for forgiveness later, right? right, right, yeah, right, right. yeah, so, no, but it's, it's part of the cross that comes with this. And, and, and financial things uh, where things are going well and notoriety and all those things is a different kind of pressure. Yeah. I, I see it as if you have an empty uh, bottle, um, pop bottle or something, and, and I think abuse and poverty and those things are like they come to the bottle and they crush the life out of it from the outside. Fame, notoriety, money, all these things, it's like blowing the air into the bottle and expanding it from the inside. Mm -hmm. Totally different kind of pressure. Mm -hmm. But what that does, it reveals the flaws, right? Mm -hmm. And we see it all the time. We see it in the media. When, when you begin to think that you need an identity or worth or value or significance, the things that matter, and you can get it from something you produce, it's just a matter of time, right? It has to come from living inside the grace of a relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. There is no other place you're gonna find certainty in a world that's constantly saying, so what have you done for me lately? Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, what have you done lately? Tell me about Crossroads. Oh. <laughs> you know, Crossroads is great. It turned out so beautifully, and it's a very different story than The Shack, although it's the same genre, which nobody knows what that is. Nobody's been able to figure out, okay, so where do we put this exactly? And um, Crossroads is a, it's a, where the shack is more of an individual journey and you get to watch this man deal with great sadness and the character and nature of God. I really believe that most of the transformational activity of our lives happens inside of relationship. We're created by a relational being who's never done anything by himself and relationships are the crucible inside of which we're both hurt and our healing happens. And so, you know, I, I wanted, and when I write, I'm, a, I'm an exploratory writer. I'm, I'm not an agenda writer. I'm not going, oh, I wanna try to communicate this, and so how best to get there? Um, that's not me. I'm going, okay, I got these questions, so let's explore them and see what happens, right? Mm -hmm. My question, one of them, in Crossroads was, how do you take a despicable guy, and Tony is despicable, and, and how do you take somebody like that who has basically shut himself off from relationships, how does grace get there? How does grace find a way in through all that isolation, all that push away? You got a guy, gas on the pedal, he is going toward the next point of success. He doesn't care about his choices and how they ripple through the lives of other people, let alone his own soul, right? But we all come to crossroads and that becomes the metaphor. It can be as simple as getting married. Now you gotta deal with somebody else yeah, at the intersection, sure. right? Mm -hmm. But it could be a death, it could be you know, an illness, it could be something debilitating, it could be the exposure of an affair, and a, of an addiction, mm -hmm. and, and we see those crossroads all the time. Yeah. But they happen even on a daily basis where we get a, a chance to choose and God respects those choices. W what did you end up communicating? I know you say you, don't, you didn't go in with an agenda, but what came out of it? <sighs> There's always multi layers to that to that answer, you know, uh, because people will hear different things. I think good creative work, um, fiction and art and music and the creative things. Even you go out and see a waterfall or you know see a rainbow, it it opens up space for people to to hear for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know there are some similar there's some themes that are the same. You'll you'll find that you as an individual matter. You'll find 
that there is a God who is pursuing us with relentless affection and it's challenging to our paradigms because we like control, because we don't trust anybody, right? So there's all these kinds of things that become, like, what are you listening to? What are you hearing you know, yeah. by the end of the book? Yeah, you missed the memo that Christian books are supposed to provide all the answers. Yeah, <laughs> I have a hard time with that, you know, because life's not like that. Mm. And part of the ambiguity of relationship is the fact that you lose control. Ask any married man, right? I never had it, so I, oh, you can't lose what you don't have, right? You know, but a lot of us have the imagination of control. <laughs> yeah. And and even this, I, I keep referring to living inside the grace of one day, that has become so essential for me because I'm in a world of smoke and mirrors, right? Yeah. Success, right. notoriety, all this stuff. Fame. Smoke mm. and mirrors, mm. right? What matters is I'm in a relationship and I get grace for one day. I don't even know if I'll be here to buy it tomorrow. You know, yeah. some cell could go sideways. And relationship, it's way harder. You know, give me a religion that says, here are the things you need to do to please whoever the God is, right? Because it's really not about God, it's about our ability to perform. Mm -hmm. Trusting, see, that's way harder, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's a, that is the lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. And you can't trust someone you don't know loves you, right? So we're inside this grace of one day. What we do is we, I call it future tripping. We have all these imaginations of everything that can go wrong. And then we spend today's grace on things that don't exist. And we don't take the thoughts captive, the empty imaginations, right? right. And we're all about considering tomorrow. And all, you know, in contra, and, and I, it's totally understandable. It took me 50 years to learn to trust the character and nature of God for a lot of different reasons because my trust was totally shattered as a child, mm. right? And it took a long time and God was very kind in the process looking back. But 50 years, you know, 50 years to wipe the face of my father completely off the face of God, 50 years to deal yeah. with sexual abuse, 50 years, you know, and trust was the journey. Yeah. And finally, I'm at a place where I trust the character of the goodness of God that he's good all the time and involved in the details of my life. I don't even have to know everything, not like I used to, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an ambiguity to that, but there's a certainty about his character. Some of your ambiguity has, has obviously gotten you into some, not yeah. trouble, but into the firing line of some people. Well, yeah. I mean, like the charge of universalism is probably the one that comes up the most. Oh, right? it comes up all the time. and and I. Doctrinally, I'm not a universalist. And there's a lot of different definitions for universalism, so you have to find out what is the person actually asking. Yeah, multiple paths to God. See, and that's, words, is, is that Jesus is one the only way? Absolutely. He's the only hope for the, hum, for the whole human race and every human being. Everything was created by, for, through, and in Jesus. When he walks on this planet, and, and here's what we as Christians don't get. He walks in the incarnation and everything is in him. That's Ephesians chapter one. Yeah. Everything's by, for, through, and in him, sustained, held together by him, right? He is, when, when you talk about a path, we're not talking about a path. We are talking about the only reality of the creator who has become incarnate, joined, God has joined himself to us, right? Yeah. And, and when, he, when he dies, everything dies. Karl Barth says, the amazing miracle is that we didn't all just lapse into non-being, yeah. right? And so, one of the things that comes from the early church fathers or whatever is the idea that even the old Adam is in Christ because everything is in him, right? And that's why you can't be separated, Romans 8, right? Because everything is by, for, through in him and no created thing can separate you from his love. Now, we can make the choice and God has great respect. And, and someone could continually choose to reject the presence of love for eternity. That's, mm -hmm. scripture is ambiguous about how it all works out. Right. But here's my question, and this is what kind of gets me into trouble, is a question, right? <laughs> okay. So my, my question is this. If God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the counsel of their mutuality in this choreographed great dance that they had, before creation, if they determined we can create in such a way that ultimately, whatever that means, 
a bazillion years from now, whatever, that we will win everything back. Would you be opposed to that? See, and I used to be opposed to it because there were people that I didn't want to make it because right. I, you know, I thought I was better than them, right. Right? right? I'm not there. And Colossians is very clear. This is what we're supposed to be praying for, yeah. right? So, and, and that kind of ambiguity and that kind of raising the questions about, well, what if hell is not punitive in nature but More restorative? Purgatory. Yeah, what if the intention is, you know, we all go through fire. Did somebody miss the memo? You know, you haven't been reading that even all the people who are followers of Jesus go through the fire. There's wood, hay, and stubble in all of our lives, and the fire is intended to free us from the very things that damage us. Now, my basic metaphor model is the relationship of a parent to a child. If you being twisted up, wicked, know how to agape your children, yeah. how much more the father. And we somehow have divorced the nature of the father so that he is a, a father of a different kind of fathering than we want to be at the core of our being. If I got a son and my son is a methamphetamine addict or I have a daughter and she is believing a lie about her worth or her value, let me tell you, I want to be a consuming fire. I want to go inside their soul and burn that out. Yeah. Why? Because I like them less now? Because they didn't live up to my expectations? Mm. Hardly. It is because I love them. And George MacDonald, great Scottish writer and pastor, and, and uh, he writes in Unspoken Sermons, Christ and Creation. He says, you know, if you trust the character and nature of God, you will run to this God and you will open your arms and say, please judge me to the core burn out of me everything right. that is keeping right. me from being free, you know, that is but preventing me from loving. If you have that ability to, to run to God, to open yourself up and, and accept everything that he has, don't you have the ability to not? Yes, but and, you don't have the ability to stop him from pursuing you. And that's where love never... Father, I'm a father. Yeah. I will never deny the reality, regardless of how lost in their imagination yeah. my son or daughter might be, I am going to pursue. Yeah. And this is why I, you know, the Romans 8 passage is so critical to me. He's going to pursue. He's going to pursue. There's love, nothing. Love, love never Well, quits. look at the list of things that can't Fa separate us from his love. Love never fails. No. It doesn't mean that it always succeeds. It means it never quits. Exactly. Right, right. That That's is exactly right. The Greek, the Greek. And, and love yeah. doesn't hold a record of wrongs either. Yeah, okay, all yeah. right, you're wading into some deep water. Well, how about this? I tell, I ask people, so, would you rather be judged by God the Father or the Son? And inevitably they'll say, well, by Jesus, because in their minds they've got a different character between the Father and the Son, yeah. for a lot of us. Yeah. And I say, well, good, you have nothing to worry about. John, you know, if you, if you read Gospel of John, it says, the Father judges no one. Mm. He has put all judgment into the hands of his Son. That's interesting. Yeah. Have you read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis? I love C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, Lewis, Weight of Glory, I think is one of the greatest pieces of work ever done. Great Divorce. And Lewis is very clear. You read the introduction to The Great Divorce, mm -hmm. and in it he is saying, we don't know yeah, about this know. period of time that in, this, in between death and what the age of judgment is right. and all this. Right. So we don't know. So we're playing with concepts and ideas here. Yeah. I kind of did that in Crossroads. I, the, I took Tony and I caught him between life and death in this space. And I've been around people who've been through comas and people who've been, had near-death experiences. And it's, there is a whole lot going on there. We have to come to the realization that life is bigger than death. Yeah. You know, but most of us live as if death is bigger than life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I catch Tony and it, and it allowed me to do some things in terms of exploring his soul and how his life co-mingles with the community. You know, there's these relationships that then become the challenges to the way he thinks and the lies that he believes and the kindness of God who does never, he, God never forces you into healing. And this is the part that we also, I don't think, get very well, that there is an incredible respect on the part of God for us as having the ability to choose to say no and for creating destruction, and for damaging. And God says, okay, I am not the author of this. 
but I'm going to climb in the middle of it with you and we're going to see if we can't build something out of it and I'll never violate you in the process. You just got to read the book, I guess. Go get Crossroads. It's in the bookstores right now. Get it online. Uh, if you like the shack, you're going to love Crossroads, I'm sure. So your wife says. That's what she says. <laughs> so I don't have to sell one. She likes it better than the shack. So, so success. Absolutely. Right, right. You got Absolutely. 14 other copies laying around that you can give to friends. You're, I already you're, you're already. Yeah, they already have. Them. Where, where I know you do. You still do some writing, some music, oh, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I do all kinds of things. And if you want to kind of connect to whatever this is, it's wmpaulyoung.com. Okay, great. It'll okay. connect you to Twitter, Facebook, all the kids, my, all the things my six-year-old grandkids understand that I don't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> check out his website again. Check out Crossroads and Paul. Thanks again for coming by. It's always a joy Honor to, to be, be here. here. Honor to be here. Love being here. Thank you.